Any clarifying questions? Anything about homework? So is this one better than the other ones in terms of example? Okay. Okay. All right. So no question about the homework done. Let's also say a few words about the project then before we get started. All right. So if you look at the project. So basically, as we'll do a final presentation, that'll be finals week, most likely in this room at the same time, Tuesday night. Uh, we're booking the room, right? So once we got the room booked, that'll be the time we'll do the uh, presentation. Plus you do a final report, right? So it'll be recorded at the end. So recorded to you sort of the last Friday of the quarter. So what does the presentation do or the report, I guess you consider them together. And basically you want to explain your problem that you're trying to solve. Explain the data you have, explain how you went about doing this and uh, what result you have, right? So it's not expected that you do a very complete job of solving the problem. Like sometimes you may find a problem where, you know, with the data you have, you can solve it. So that's not an issue. The issue, right? so I was looking for both in the presentation and the report is at least to explain the problem you want to solve first. Explain what you hope, you know, what you hope the answer will be, right? What kind of answer are you looking for? Right? If you don't get there, you don't get there, and that's fine for the project, okay? So for the report, again, there's no set format for the report, right? As long as you explain, you know, what, what are you trying to do? Where did you get the data? What do you try to process the data? What do you try to learn? And uh, whatever result you got from that, okay? So any questions about the presentation and the report? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question about the project. So, so far, we've been looking at uh, data science papers. Right. Uh, but what is uh, the project to be around? Right, okay. So let me say that. So the project, so the topic, should be anything to do with energy or power, right? So we look at data science, but the application should have something to do with energy, okay? So for some, for example, forecasting the stock price is not a good project. Forecasting the energy market price is a very good project, okay? So at least the sums it has to do Somehow, with the energy we use, right? So that's the uh, yeah, mostly electrical. You can link this to other form of energy. For example, in the past, people have looked at you know what if uh, say we switch hydrogen versus electrical and comparing the cost, things like that is okay. Right. So energy, some energy form that could be turning to electrical. So very broad topics to do with energy. But uh, again, do not do you know, stock market price, do not do computer vision. If it's just computer vision, do not do you know, recognizing handwritten characters. Those are not related, okay? Right, so you want to do right, so something like you know, studying, if I run a large language model, how much power it consumes, that's okay. Right, so at the end of the day, it has to do something with energy, okay, it cannot be completely devoid of you know, energy, okay, so is there the unit of watt and kilowatt hours and things like that has to do something with this project. Right, so with that, I guess I'll continue with the rest of you, how do you find a topic, right, so there's different ways you can think of a topic. One is, for example, does something, you are interested in, okay? So some topic in energy, maybe I'll interest to you. Uh, some of you who have electrical engineering background, you may be very interested in uh, things in actually electric power. Right? There's, you may be interested in how, you know, how do you integrate renewables? This thing may be of interest to you. So that's one way to think of a project. So you have that sort of interest, 
Are you gonna let me know, right? I'll find some data, I'll talk to these, find the right source of data, try to find a scope of project. So there's one form of funding a project. Second is you have sort of no intrinsic interest in electric power, which is totally fine. And then this may be like something, you know, that looks good. On your CV. Okay, so you may have sort of I have no interest in renewables, climate change, whatever. I just want to do a product that showcases, you know, have done this kind of project, which is again totally fun in this class. If you're interested in that, then think about what would look good on your CV, right? So maybe you say, okay, I really want to use a tool that uh, does, you know, you scale. I think that's a hot topic. I use generative models. I don't really know how to use generative models, but I just want to do that. So it looks good on my CV. There's plenty of topics in power actually that use generative models. Okay, so I'm sort of a king with all those generative models you see out there. Okay, so, but then if you go this route, you have to tell me what interests you. Right? Don't just say, oh, give me something I can do in three weeks and also looks good on my CV and complement everything else I do. But I, I don't know what else you're doing. And so here you need to tell me what kind of tools you want to use. Okay, so that's one possibility. The third one is just you know just a project. Right, so I just want to you know do something. No, you know you may not want to spend all that much time on it. It's also okay. Let me know that. Just tell me, hey, you know I'm taking a lot of courses or I have other things to do. I just want to do a project to satisfy requirement of the course. And this being a PMP graduate level course. Everybody essentially gets either 3.9 or 4.0. Okay, if you don't cheat, that's the GPA you will get. In the last quarter, uh, last time, people did cheat. So that was some issues. And uh, again, when you write code online, we can track everything. It's quite clear whether there's cheating going on. So we can, so pretty easy to catch this. But as long as you don't cheat, then you get a 3.9, 4.0, sort of, it's not, you're not gonna get a very low GPA out of class. And you say, hey, you know, I just wanna do something for three weeks where the data is ready, you know, I know sort of clearly what should come out of it. And again, that's okay, right? let me know, and I'll find you that kind of project. Okay, so all of these are okay. Uh, but then it's sort of incumbent on you to communicate with me what you want to do. That can help you to find the data and scope the right project. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you. Right? So I'm not going to give the class broad topics or very specific or sort of very specific topics or specific instructions, because then everybody will do the same thing and sort of recycle. Like, oh, so I want to avoid that. But uh, as long as you know you communicate with me what exactly you want to get out of this project, then there's sort of plenty of data out there. Okay. Questions about this? So if you just if you just search, that's not very interesting, right? What kind of question are you trying to get? So hopefully it will have a data component that you do some data analysis on it. Right. Hopefully you have to use Jupyter Hub to run some code right, to get the project working. It's not right, so I'm not sure what the question is. You can use those data to do something if that's right. So again, depending on what you want to do, right? If you, it's better to think if, you know, from all those cities, 
what question can I answer? What interesting thing can I look at? What kind of conclusion can I draw? Right. So if you want to understand, you know, like predicting how the power usage in cities will change, then that's fine. Right? If you just say, oh, I somehow Google around and found this data, there's many things you can do, but it's probably not, you know, a, I don't know, right? So if you have a goal that I'm not sure, there's plenty of data out there. That's fine, yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah. So you want to do that target, that's totally fine. Yeah. But it's important to do community. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Right. There's no matter. Yeah, there's it. Are my eyes Oh, the report. Okay, yeah. So let me write the data for the report. Uh, I sent out the email. I don't quite remember. So this will be the last Friday of the quarter. I don't even remember what. Friday. Yeah, Friday of one. I don't even remember the date of that. Eight, six. Yeah, what do you say in the email? I, I track in the email. Do the night? Is that, is that a Friday? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good night. <laughs> yeah, so six of presentation, you know, we, we cannot, so that's sort of the time we have to do presentation that time. And then Friday is the latest, you can't hand anything. The academic quarter ends after that. So the quarter is done. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Is there is a million data sets for energy and power, right? So I can I, I could not point you to a specific data set because just for the city of Seattle, we we'll have terabytes of data, energy and power. Just for, for example, if you look at our own campus, you can get data for any building you want. You can get data for this building. So there was a team that was doing, you know, for IMA, if you put solar panel on IMA, how much power can you save? And that was a project. And uh, there's ground truth data from IMA. So just with this campus, just a building data, every day we collect a few gigabytes of data. So there's sort of plenty of data out there. There's, you know, if you look at the California ISO, California data, every second it generates about a few gigabytes of data. Right. So you can, those are all publicly available. You can pull it if you want. There's an API, you can pull it, right? So, right. so if you use that kind of data, it's quite the sort of ambitious part of actually getting the API to work. It's not trivial. But the process of data, you can save them all, right? So that's why, you know, check with me for the data source. But uh, you should, again, have some idea of what, you know, either you want to look at a specific topic in power energy, Maybe you want to look at, the, in the past you have done, what is the difference between the state of like California, which is very aggressively trying to integrate renewables versus the state like West Virginia, which is trying very hard not to integrate renewables. What does the data show? What are the trends? Are the low different? You know, what, how does the weather impact those two? This is something people have done in the past. This is again, a perfectly good project, right? So there is, you want to do something like that, then I can tell you where to get data from those two states. Again. Right, there are people who in the past again said that, you know, they really want to use LSTM for some project. Right? That's a tool they're very interesting. Then again, I can point you to the right things. There are people who said, I just want to do a project. I just want to spend, you know, sort of the minimum amount of time on this project to do okay in this class. That's fine. There's again, Many, many sort of millions of data sets out there right now. Okay. So, really, it's not time to think about uh, sort of what you want to do and uh, any topic of specific interest. So, a, quick, a thing for this, right? So, a lot of people take this because of PMT in general, because they want to go get out of your city. You need to spend some effort for this. There are enough people taking this kind of class and doing similar projects, you need to show at least some depth for this kind of thing. 
this is not an ability to okay, do. So, so plenty of people taking data science and whatever courses, right? That's not trivial to get something that looks good on your CV and you can talk about. Okay, so this is not, these two are not sort of in different ways. This often ends up to be more complicated because you're using more advanced tools, look better. Okay, so this depends on what you want to do, there's a simple data science behind that. So again, if you're interested in buildings, then canvas data that's clean, you know where exactly where the building is, you know a lot of that information. So again, something to think about. So this is teams of up to three. Okay, so one, two, or three people. Other questions? Okay. So that would depend on how many teams we have ending up. So it would be like a so the longest of presentation is probably 20 minutes. There's more teams will cut it. Right? So if everybody's doing individual project, there's not many 20 minutes. So it depends on how many teams. And the trick with presentation is really not talk for 20 minutes, it's how to sort how what you want to say in 20 minutes. Right? So that, that's really the trick. <laughs> so again, the, the, the course is graded very, very detailed. It's grading. When you do any of this, grading is not going to make a material impact in your grade. It's basically like getting 3.9 or 4.0. Okay. Other things? About the project? Okay, so again, I'm a resource for the project. I can pretty much tell you where the data are. I can tell you the scope of the project. I can tell you whether it being too ambitious or try something, you know, maybe too simple. But it's up to you to communicate with me. Okay, so I'm not going to chase after everyone to get a very clear defined project. But it's basically for you to think about what you want to do and then communicate with me. Right, so I will find, I will, so I will, help you every step along the way, but I will not you know, chase after you say, oh, you, you didn't do anything, how about you do this? Or if you don't like this, how about you, you don't like A, how about you do B? You don't like B, how about you do C? I'm not gonna do that. Right? So you figure out whether you wanna do A, B, or C, I'll help you right? so do any of this type of projects. All right, okay, so that's for this project. The homework, no questions, I guess, you know, after the, you guys sending this one, Next homework, uh, this next homework will be either out tomorrow or Thursday. That'll be rough, very similar to the format of the kind of what you're doing. Okay. All right, good. Again, for the homework, please do not copy each other. It's flagged automatically. <laughs> so it's flagged. You may not realize this when people write code, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies in your code. Right? There's spacing in your code, they're commenting in your code. If you get to you know code that is the same, that's extremely unlikely. <laughs> Two people will independently write exactly the same thing. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that for that to happen. We do flag for that. It happened last time. People copied, right? So that's they don't want to do that. That's <laughs> nice. Okay, all right. So now let's go on with the rest of the class. So uh, for the past, uh, we've been talking about linear regression. Right? We've been talking about state estimation. So if you look at state estimation, it's basically, you've been looking at this in your homework, something like this. Okay, so we're trying to minimize this. This uh, has a color for formula. You can derive all that and so on. So this is particular easy optimization part. And uh, what this does is basically saying you have measurements, right? So Z is your vector of measurements. And from the measurement, you can try to guess what your true state is. And you want the least one. But in practice, basically, there will be some sensors that's good and some sensors that's bad. Okay, so you may have some new sensors that has very small noise. You may have some sensors that has very large noise. Okay, so there'll be... OK, 
Okay, so there will be some sensors that are just better than others. Uh, in particular, things in how so things in power energy where it turns out the current is definitely hard to measure. Voltage is easier to measure, so that's one example. Or just maybe depending how much money is the cost. So the problem with that formulation is this formulation doesn't differentiate between the quality of the sensors or the noise you have in the measurement. Okay, so. Any ideas? Let's say I have one sensor that's good, one sensor that's bad. What should I do with a measurement? Like how should I include that in my optimization problem? Or how should we think the quality of sensors? How do we measure, let's say I gave you, right? So you know, it's a system of two sensors, maybe bus one is you know, much, much more accurate than bus two, the measurement. So in engineering, typically, how do we think about this kind of accuracy, measurement accuracy? Right, so the way we think about it is basically, we treat the noise a sensor as a random variable with different variants with different basically how large this square can be. So the way we'll treat it is we're gonna think of an additive error basically you have some noise right so as sensor I we'll think of this as a Gaussian random variable with mu zero and some there is sigma I squared. So what does this say? This basically says your error is something that's centered around the mean. Right? So if you look at your error, so because it's random, so there's sort of probability distribution of the values this error can take. And then for a sensor that's good, you will have a small spread, and very small spread. For a sensor that's bad, you have a larger spread. So the quality of sensors is how long this error is being measured at that particular at that particular number. Okay. So if you do a measurement, and so again, so let's say you have two, maybe you have one noise look like that, you have another noise that looks very, very wide. So this will be a sort of better sensor, smaller. Sigma square. Okay. So a better sensor means your noise is more concentrated around zero. You have smaller air. So worse sensor if your noise is more spread. You're less certain about your measure. Okay. So that was make sense for the air model. Okay. All right. So why is it easier? Right. So here I'm saying the sensor is sort of air that's spreading out. But I'm saying I'm saying that sort of at least the, it's centered around the correct value you want to measure, right? It doesn't add a mean to it. Why is that? Why is this a good assumption? Or should I also interpret there's sort of offset in the mean? In almost all this kind of modeling, the mean is to be zero. You almost always assume the noise has zero. So the reason you assume the noise has zero mean is because if the mean is not zero, you can just subtract this up. If you take many measurements and the mean is not zero, you can compute the mean and just subtract the mean off of your measurement. Okay, so the a constant offset in your measurement typically is not very hard to deal with. You just subtract that constant offset off, and you have your correct measure. So what if you cannot get rid of and then have the noise spread around the mean? Okay, so this you cannot get. But mean you can always subtract out from the measure. So you can always center your measure, but the uh, noise level changes. Okay. So when you buy a sensor, it basically will tell you this kind of measure. So you buy a sensor, it will say this thing has a noise signal to noise ratio of 20 dB or something. 
This is the following the whole lot of So this is our model. So how do we incorporate into that optimization model? So basically, when you have a sensor with large noise, should you trust it more or less? That's a, you have a very crappy sensor that has a huge noise around it. Do you want to trust it more or less in your calculation of the ground truth thing? You want to trust it less, right? So if you have a large noise, it means it's less reliable. So you want to discount the measurement coming on that sensor. Conversely, you have a sensor with very small noise, you want to trust it more, right? You know that's sort of very close to the actual value you have. So the way to put this sort of inverse relationship onto the uh, optimization problem is basically the following. As you trust the sensors with smaller noise, More right, so you want to try this more. So what? So the mathematically, this basically now we do as you weight the errors. So you mean x? You have a measurements. What you do is you now you subtract away. So this is what you do, you, you include a weight on the denominator when you do this calculation. This, this is how you use offset between your measurements and what you think it should be from your state equation. Before we don't have this, we can just square everything down here. Now we add this down here. So if this weight is very large, that means this term doesn't matter very much. Okay, so if this weight is very large, this term doesn't matter. That's this counter may optimize the mass. So they see this error doesn't matter. If this is very small, then this will make this more important. Okay, so this error will matter. Then we optimize over x. You pick this on me. So this is called a weight of the least square. That's the purpose of how much you think the uh, measurement is important. They're still in the importance of the measurement. So this is called a weighted. Least square. Yeah. Any questions about this? At least intuition, intuitively. Okay. So, right. So you can have extreme case. So this is infinity. So what happens when this is infinity? This is infinity. This basically says your sensor really doesn't do anything and measure any value. So we don't care about this. The measurement doesn't matter. What happens if this is zero? Hmm? You can just go infinity except one. This, if this is zero, then this function on top has to be zero. Right. So it was not zero. So if this is zero, means your measurement is exactly zero. The measurement is exactly zero. Then your state, then the the value coming from your state should measure exactly the measure. Okay, so that's the other extreme. Okay, so if you this is zero, then you really believe this measurement is exact. This often comes up with something when this is when the principal thing is you have. So then this can come. You can have measurements when this is exactly. So it just that means this. Right, so this weight of these parts, normally you know this weight, so you're going to do five sensors, you can actually work on this. Or you can do sensor after the calibration, we'll tell you what that is. Right, and uh, so a, okay, so you, when the weight of these squares, this is again not terribly difficult to solve because you can write this in the following manner. There's a, there's a vector notation of writing this. It turns out if you sum over this is so you can pull this out. Right? 
Okay, so you can pull this thing out. And what you can do now is you cannot define a matrix with those terms in this diagonal. So we're gonna let S be a diagonal matrix. Okay, we're gonna let S be this diagonal matrix. And uh, the summation squared, this is exactly S multiplied So the, these are exactly equal. Basically, if you run this way, as after this, you still have the equal error. And you multiply each term, and then it's one of those in my square. And this diagonal matrix, this expression, is exactly that expression. It comes out by basic uh, matrix algebra. Okay, so the reason we want to write like this, so again, you can have a closer approach. Like this. Okay. So the nice yeah. thing is, when we do calculations, we can write things in vector and a matrix notation. Then we can directly do algebra on the vector and the matrix. We don't need to do this over infinite over the sum and stuff. So for example, here we can again directly differentiate with vector x. I had to minimize this function. Okay. So that's the nice thing about matrix notation. That kind of thing. So you differ differentiate against x. And this is, we can solve this in close form. Okay, so we're not gonna write out ex for exactly what the close form is, but uh, once you get to this notation, you can basically take a derivative and solve this in stuff. And this is when the sum passes. You have a weighted, you have a weight, you have weights on the systems, and then you do this. Okay. Yeah. Close four, in close four. Yeah, close four. Yeah. So it means you can write out an equation directly given the x. But uh, from now on, we'll basically just use command, right? So these sort of building functions. So we're not going to write down what this is. Yeah, go ahead. Sigma? Yeah, so sigma is normally given for a sensor. When you buy a sensor, we'll tell you what the fidelity of the sensor is. Right? When you buy the sensor, we'll tell you the sensor is accurate to, you know, for example, uh, from normally one kilowatt or accurate within half a kilowatt. We'll tell you there's the SNR, the sensor is accurate within 20 dB. So you have this kind of accuracy. So most times you have so whenever you buy any sensor, this will be given. Otherwise, the sensor is not in use. When people build sensors, the way you can tell the sensor is the there. Right? So these are all given to you. And then you do your own testing as well. So that's normally assumed to be there. Okay. So you saw this kind of thing in practice. What this allows you to do once you have this sort of weighted uncertainty is <laughs> You can, so this this is actually enables you to do quite a bit in practice because often in practice, we don't have enough sensors. Okay. So we don't have enough sensors. We, for example, for a very large power system, we may barely have, you know, the num we may just have a little bit more than the number of states we have in the system. So we don't have enough sensors. But what do you do when you don't have enough sensors? But what's the only thing you can do when you don't have enough sensors? It's not a short question. Okay? If you don't have enough sensors, what, what do you do? Sorry? Yeah, you have uh, no money. Your boss refuses to give you money to buy more sensors. So your engineer is sitting in the control room, don't have enough sensors, but you really want more numbers into the state of the Yeah, Right, so what we do is basically guess. Right, so this actually happens a lot. 
in house. I don't have the measurement I want right now, either because I don't have enough sensors or the sensor is broken or something. What we can do is engineers often guess. Okay, so operators. You just guess. You, you guess a number. Okay, so there is a fancy name for this. Okay, so you don't want to call guess. Guess is not a good word to show up when you write this kind of thing. So anybody know what is a fancy name for guess? No, sort of there's there's a made up word. Sounds very fancy, by the uh, so the so fancy name for guess is called a pseudo measurement. You see this in power system literature. Often we'll say we assume this is measurement, and then we have the following pseudo measurement. What pseudo measurement means is I guess there's no sense. I'm going to guess a number. I'm going to call it pseudo measurement. What happens when you guess is it doesn't mean you're wrong, or it doesn't mean the guess is useless, and you can associate an error with this. So this means even if you guess, if you have no sensor, it still looks like a measurement with some error. So you can treat it as if you have a sensor with that level of measurement error. Okay, so you can guess. If you're a good operator, you can actually guess uh, pretty accurately. If you're not a very good operator, no, you don't guess very accurately. Okay, so if you're very good at guessing, your guesses become basically become measurements associated with some error level. And then you you just run this. Yeah, you basically just run this. Okay. So this type of formulation actually makes everything consistent. You, if your sensor is broken, for example, you have to guess, then you will just guess. And the people are pretty good at this operators, actually. But yeah, yes. Um, now, this function predicts the uh, error. So that's a good question. So let's look at this first. Let's look at this. Okay. So let's look at this function. Okay. So suppose, right? So let's say we want to. So now, oh yeah, let's, we can do this. Right? We can just do s, z minus h x. So we want to solve this. We can well let x star be the optimal solution to this. So again, x star is fairly easy to calculate. Give okay, the solution to this. So now you can look at you plug this in. Okay, so right, so you compute x star, you plug this in. And then you have this. This is the error level. This is estimation. This is your weighted estimation. Now the question is, how big do you expect this to be? Right. So this is this is the question. Well, we know you can find the optimal x star. So that's all. the question is not how do I find the x star that we find this function. We know how to do that. The question is after x star. This is the how big is it? How big should it be? Can this be zero? Why not? Sensors will always have noise. That's one reason. The second reason this cannot be zero is typically you have more measurements than number six. Yeah. So remember in your homework, your state is only the four elements. You have a lot more measurements of the higher measurements. So you have more measurements in states. You cannot make everything zero because of this. Okay, so this cannot be zero. This is not zero. You don't expect this to be zero. And so this is. Right? Or you don't expect this to be zero. But is there a sense of how large this should be? Is there a sense of this being unreasonably large or unreasonably small? Right, so that actually we can do. And so that's the next topic. 
And looking at this step, what this tells you, this will tell you whether you're solving the problem at the expected level. Okay, so there is a an expected error. Okay, so you cannot be if you're too close to zero, that's a problem. Because you typically you cannot really make this thing very small. If you're too large away from zero, that's also a problem, right? This should not be unreasonably large given the noise level here. So there's sort of right sort of size of the air you have. And that is how we determine whether, for example, the sensor is working correctly. Is this problem being solved correctly? Are the sensor is working correctly? Is there a sensor that's malfunctioning in the field and things like this? Okay, so, or also this is used to see whether somebody is trying to hack your measurement or not. Okay, so one thing you care about is, uh, suppose somebody hacks your measurement, how do you know people actually hack your measurement? You can tell that by looking at the expected size of, him, of this. Right, so this is called bad data detection. And so to say that, are my measurements, you know, making sense, right? It, are there sensors now functioning? Okay, right, so as you can ask, is there a cyber attack? So is there somebody trying to hack your sensors? You know, did we know? So is everything going correctly? Uh, so this is important because does anybody remember or have heard of the 2003 blackout? That's wiped out. So in 2003, there was a big blackout. That's basically wiped out much of the Eastern sort of grid. All the way from Ontario down through New York, Pennsylvania, that was entirely dark. And the reason that black blackout happened is basically this algorithm that's supposed to do bad data detection did not function correctly. Somebody did a software update, and not software didn't update correctly. So this there was a like sensor malfunction, so there was something going wrong that was not caught. And that led to a blackout uh, impacting. A million people costing however many billions of dollars after that. So this is actually a very important part of the system. And the, the, the hard thing is there's no obvious way to graph this data. Right? So it's not like you can just pause the data and look at it to see if there's an outlier or something being unreasonable. Right, you have a lot of data and a lot of sensors, a very large system. You don't, re you can't really do this visually. So there's a classic technique for this. So the classical. It's called chi-square test. Okay, so the, this this is a Greek letter. This is called chi-square. So this reads like chi-square. So this is the word. Chi-square is chi from Lita and Name for it. And this has the following. Chi-square test is a... Basically, this computes expected error, right? So this computes expected error. So this thing that suppose equals hx plus some error you have. Okay. And we're going to assume that x is in Rn and z is in Rm. Okay. And m is greater than that. Okay. So you have more magnets, you have number six. So what happens if you have less magnets? That's it. 
Uh, what happens if you don't have enough measurement? You have loss of state, but uh, you don't have enough measurement. So if you, if you have more states of measurement, basically your states are not uniquely determined. There's many, many states that will give you the same measurement. Right, so this is basically a linear system of equations. If you have lots of equations never on nodes, you cannot solve this, you cannot solve them here. There's multiple solutions to that linear system. And that's not a very useful measure. That's not a very useful uh, set of estimated power. Okay. So you always assume you have a measure of those things. If you don't have this actual space of those things, you basically need to see the measurements. Your elements are in the thing. Okay, we always require more measurements than state. Otherwise, it's not uniquely determined. And then it's a useless, uh, then it's a useless problem. That's right. You, you cannot do state estimation that way. Is that point clear? Why do you have that? Yeah. How is this related to the assignment? When is the assignment that um, the measurements take down for, for the homework? So the, right. So, but you still should have more measurement than states, right? And it's taking sort of less, right? So it's, you, 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 you cannot solve a case. Roy, if you have less measurement than states, your solution is not unique. There's many, many states will give you the same measurement. And that's again, not useful. I don't know what state it is. And there's many states that will explain the measurement perfectly. And that's not very useful, right? So you always want more measurement than states in this case. Okay, so this is something you always make. Again, right? So again, if you're, if you're if this matrix, because if you're this matrix, as a very flat matrix, then you can just invert it. All the little solution class that you don't want that to happen. <laughs> so now we want to compute the expected there in V minus HX, assuming it's Gaussian. Okay, so we're gonna assume you have some Gaussian error, some normally distributed error, and then how large is this thing? How large does this thing get for you? Okay, so to, again to be, Right, yeah, so, uh, so we're going to assume that. And we're now going to do this, but when you look at state estimation, basically we're going to say that after waiting, by the sigma psi squared, okay, we expect so if now if you look at each one of the measurement minus this thing estimation squared, this is roughly a normal zero one variable square. So if you compare the the measures the measure value and the expected value you get a positive state. Right. So if you divide out the uh, variance, you basically do this with a standard model. So you have zero mean, there is one. And this error is pretty much this function of very variance. You're squaring a noise, you're squaring the noise. This is how big you expect this to be. And then this is, right, so you take a Gaussian number and square this. So if you look at this value as, M larger than N. So for the for N measurements, we can explain them perfectly. For the rest of And minus n measurements, they have 
So they they behave. Like, okay, and so you take n measurements, you have n states. So from the n states, there's n measurements you can explain perfect. You can solve those equations. You have some other measurements because you have more equations than unknowns. You cannot solve those equations exactly. Then you basically, the error you have, each one of there behaves something like this. And then the total expected error. Is the summation over right? So you basically summing up m minus n of these. Okay, so this is summing of them. So let's say you have three measurements to state. You expect the error to be just a square of the of the tenor calcium. You have, let's say, 10 measurements in a seven states. You expect the error to be three copies summing up of the same result. So it basically says, depending on the number of measurements you have and the number of states you have, you can have a sum sort of how large you think the error will be at the end of the day. And there's a name to this. The name is precisely chi square measurement. So people have studied this. More for many, many years. And uh, we have characterized what happens in some of random Gaussian cycles. We know exactly sort of the behavior of this kind of thing. So the sum, again, the sum of Gaussians this is extremely well studied. Right? So there's some k terms. This is called a chi square random variable with degree k. Okay, so if you sum, if you have okay, so this is plotting, if you have one of them. It's sort of expected to look like this, but two of them, you see how it looks like this, and one of them. So, what from this is you can basically look at how large the pair is, and then become, and look at how likely is that pair to happen. Okay, so, let's say if you have summing up, in this case, three of them, and then if your error is not big, then you think, okay, this is very typical. I probably don't have a bad day. This is exactly what I predicted. This is. If you have some of three of them, and your error turns out to be somewhere in the tail, this is very unlikely to be this unlucky by the case. And this happens if you have some wrong measurements. Okay. So you know how many components you're summing up. You go this chart and see how likely that this particular error is going to happen. If it occurs very to the tail of this guy, you have a bad instrument. You have some data, you have some um, device, so that's how I'm getting friendly. As to the tail of this you know, very small error, you probably your solvers, how computers are. Oh, so this can happen because you're getting data. If you don't want the data correctly, you may have the misalignment of data. So you may be using future data to look at past measurements. You may be sort of picking your head. You may be using the data that you don't currently have. They have a very small data. That could happen. And you may, you may not have access. So this can be, for example, a lot of measurements in the system you get maybe every minute or so. And you want to do this, you know, you want to do state estimation maybe every four seconds. You could, if you're not careful with running the data, you may be using the data measurement itself to predict, to predict itself. Okay, so you may be using, I know the future value, I didn't line up correctly, actually use, you know, wait a long enough using the future value to predict this out. So that can happen. You can have sort of unreasonably small errors. Okay. Okay. So if this, this could also happen, you may have only one body of this. All this. Another reason that has to happen, you may have some good reason. Can you not think of another case where your errors may be unreasonably small? There is actually one other case where the error is unreasonably small. And that's not, let's say, not, it's not a physical problem with any of the system. Okay, 
right? So the error can be unreasonably small often under cyber attacks. So what does cyber attack do? Cyber attack means I hack your measurement, right? So I hack your measurement, but I don't hack it just to hack it. I want to, I want you to have a wrong state estimation. Basically, I want the state you think the system is under to be different than the true state. And then you do something wrong and the system blows up. So I have to fake the state I want you to have. Then what they, they can compute is they can compute, you know, give some fake X, compute what the fake Z is, and feed that to your system and say, this is a, this is the value I got. And then there, because the data is generated, this sort of fake data generated perfectly, when you run the estimation, you actually, wow, you know, my state fits exactly. It's very much the sort of fake state people want you have. And that's also a yes, that's also a patch. Right. So Basically, everything is too far away from the middle of the problem. And then you have software is looking at the second air. We'll fly. There's something wrong with the measurement. Or fly to wrong measurements. Okay. Right. Any other questions about this? Okay, so this technique actually dates back to Gauss. So this is discovered by Gauss. And what he was doing, he was starting from the motion of stars. And there is you really take repeated measurements and you want to see how good is my SP. And the error and all this thing came out. There. So this is very commonly used. Right? With the assumption that the error is Gaussian. And the error is not Gaussian, then you have other things to do. But if error is Gaussian, this is actually quite robust in determining there's something wrong with your measurement. So you get something that's too far away, that determines something is wrong, right? So, but data detection basically says that, let's say you have some uh, standard where you think uh, what the error should be. And uh, if you're, right, so if this is the uh, so expected error here, Anything falls outside, you flag this, and you say there's something wrong with it. Right? There's, there is a there is a bad data I have in my system. Okay. Okay. Good. So this bad data detection, or looking at this kind of curves. This is very good. This is uh, extremely good. I'm telling you there is bad thing. There's something wrong with it. If it doesn't, if it's too far away from where you think the air should be. What it doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you which sensor is wrong. Okay, so this sort of thing looks like all sensor measurements together. It says there's something wrong with it. And it doesn't tell you which sensor is wrong. It doesn't tell you you know, where this error, which, where the bad data is coming from. So how will you detect which sensor is wrong? Is there a way to do that? So this is very classical. You, you, there's charts like this, look at it. Detecting which sensor is wrong is actually more uh, modern problem. This came out only in the last say, 10 years or so. Can you suggest a way to detect which one is wrong? I have all these measurements. I know there's something wrong. One of them is wrong. I have a bad data detection. I figure out one of them is wrong. Okay. Right? You can graph, but graph normally doesn't really help all that much. Because what happens is you're waiting by the expected right, sigma score anyways. So all of this appears roughly similar to each other. It's hard to tell when you just graph. And graph is, right, so remember in an actual power system, something in, let's say, California, there's 10,000 something states. There's 100,000 measurements. It's very hard to sort of visually detect what is going on. So how do I get the data to tell me? How do I get the data to tell me? Yeah. Right. 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 
Right, so that's one suggestion, right? So this kind of historical value. Right, so let's say I measure this current yesterday, or when I measure this current, it always be in 10 amps. Today, the sensor is telling me it's 100 amps, so it's probably something about that sensor. So that's one way to do it. As you just look at history, you say this measurement is changing unreasonably large. There's another way to do it. Actually, it relates to the previous homework you guys did. To detect which one is wrong. So another way to do it is actually using L1 norm. So there is a way to formulate the problem where you can basically do L1 regularized regression that's very similar to the homework you guys did. And that will actually pick up which one is wrong. Because L1 tends to give you this sort of sparse solutions. So that will have a sort of more point-wise selection. We tend to bias towards sort of where that, this regularization actually tends to be black. They predict their sensor that's what's wrong. We we'll tend to not to use that sensor. And then if you do the correct L1 normalization. So you can look at the little experience. There is a really sort of quick you regularize it more. Okay. So I'm going to say it's sort of slightly more, quite slightly bit more math than why this is the case. But again, this is a good uh, product. Right. So there'll be papers and code doing that. So if you're interested in doing this kind of detection, then I can uh, point you to where the paper is, right, where the data you can find. But here's how, uh, so this is actually sort of bigger than that in a single process. Before we sort of very labeled to figure out uh, which one is that, this came along with much, much faster than the other best. This L1 regularization tends to select the best sensor for you, actually. Tends to flag sensor that's bad. Okay. So this requires a bit more math, right? So again, you're interested in doing this product, uh, let me know. We can discuss. Um, you know, we're a little bit more to go over this. Again, the coding here is very simple with this. Okay. But the historical value, again, so we're gonna look a little bit more like this because this is actually fairly new. This is only has been used in the uh, last 10 years or so. And the reason we only use this in the last 10 years is because before sort of the advancement of all this sort of learning stuff, processing data is actually not true. You have to spend a lot of time processing the data, writing the code, and so on. In this last 10 years, once you have the data, the amount of process, you know, the amount of manual work you have to do to write the code has reduced by quite a bit. And actually, there are people who are now looking at data on this. You take historical measurements, you take historical states, and you try to forecast, right, based on this history, what the future will be. And then you have current measurements. Then use that as new information. Then you basically compare what gives what history will give you versus what your sort of, you know measurement currently will give you, and now you can get out the uh, bad bad data measurements. Okay. You can get out things that way. Right. Yeah. Good. This requires like classes to be changed. Right. So this assumes you don't have topology change, for example. And assume you're looking at the same system over and over again. Right. Yes, you can do this. Yes, that's a good question. But also, again, leads very interestingly to the next thing is, can you learn topology? Right. So often the question is, is that H is non -known. Okay. So remember before as we have, right? So we're, we're given Z minus HX. We're saying, okay, given H and Z measurements, H sometimes is not known. This can happen. This in basically sort of distribution. Are not so well known, are not. Or the topology of distribution system. So there's no guarantees that you actually know what the topology of distribution system is. 
Okay, so H is done then. And then, so here the problem, the question becomes, given measurements, can we figure out what H is? Okay, so now the question is, let's say that Z is equal to HX plus some noise. Suppose these are known. Find H. Okay, so you can ask this question. So the technology that we find that allows you to do this, the goodness today, we have weights measure the same. But before we could not measure the energy. So this was not a valid question to ask. It's almost the same anyways. Nowadays we can actually measure the angle. Okay, so are sort of now measurable. The way you do it, this is something called a micro PMU. What this micro PMU does, this is a Fourier transfer and filter plus a GPS. So this device is actually not difficult to construct. The way you measure angle, all this difficulty comes from now you don't have a clock synchronization. Right? Now your problem with angles is they're not clock synchronized. So when I measure a sinusoid in this building, I don't know my clock is synchronized to a measurement in another building. This micro PME, this is basically a GPS synchronized. Okay? So you synchronize a clock using GPS, you have a timestamp in all the sinusoids you have, and you can get angles out of this. Then it's not very difficult to measure angles. Right? Okay, so okay, so why does GPS need a clock synchronization? Or why does GPS have very good clock synchronization? So yeah, so right, so basically to measure angles, you need clock synchronization. People have been trying to do that in the power system for a very long time, and they didn't have the technology to do it. And suddenly one day GPS, global positioning system, came along. And very quickly, power system people figure out, hey, there's a clock in there. That's synchronized across the globe, basically. Why does GPS have this feature? So we luck into this. It was not something hard. It was a very hard problem. But then people were doing GPS, then immediately this problem was solved for us. Why does GPS have to have this clock synchronization? So you don't understand the okay. Okay, so do you understand the notion of a clock? Why why is there a clock synchronization in angle measurements? Okay, right. So this actually is an important question in power. That's because often people say, Oh, why don't you just measure angle? So one there's one way we can measure angle in the following way. Okay. So there is so every basically every signal you measure coming out AC system is a sinusoid. Okay, it's some sinusoid. So how do I know the angle difference, let's say, between the two sinusoid? Okay, so how do I know the angle difference between the two sinusoid? That is at two distinct locations in the network. Okay, so let's say this is the other one. This is maybe Portland. I want to see, okay, what is the phase difference between these two sinusoid? So, so that, that makes sense. Okay. So there's one way we can do this as let's agree we all take a measurement at precisely 7 p.m. and look at the value of the sinusoid we get. Okay, so one, one agreement is let's say this is 7 p.m. We both measure at exactly 7 p.m. I can read out the value of this. Then by looking, I don't look at this, I'm looking at this value. I can tell you what the phase loss is because it's right? so that that's still making sense. Okay, so now the question is how can the other area important? How do we know that it's exactly 7 p.m.? How do we know that 7 p.m. is the same thing for us? Right? So our agreement is at a particular at the same time, 
I'm going to take a measurement. Okay? And by taking the measurement at the same time, I can know the phase offset between two sinusoids. But if we're not physically together, how do we know we're taking the measurement at the same time? So this is called a problem of clock synchronization. As your 7 p.m. has to mean the same as my 7 p.m., right? Right, so is that clear for measurement? This is a hard problem. Again, your washes will drift by more than this. Your washes will have significant enough drift that our synchronization wouldn't matter. So you have to say the GPS. Right, the area in GPS is much smaller than 60 hertz. That's a basic benefit. The benefit is that GPS has air, but as long as the air is much smaller than the latency cycle, right, which is one over six, then it's okay. That's basically what power uses. And there are some air in GPS, but GPS is basically accurate to the microsecond, which is good enough for us. We just need some sort of millisecond accuracy. The GPS measurements, right? right? So this until this has until this we cannot do this. We cannot directly measure it. Okay. So we're waiting for GPS to do that. And the reason GPS have that is basically GPS has to correct for time dilation problems that they have there in a grad. Right. So this is sort of you know something that uh, basically came along. We were designing this for a number of years. This came along, and we can do this measurements now. Okay. All right. So, assuming you can do this measurement, then the problem is actually easy in topology learning. Because what you do is you take many measurements of z and x across time. Right. So let's say you measure z and x, copies of z and x across, you know, for every hour or so. What you have is you have z1 equals h x. Some air, z n equals h x n plus some other air. This is to estimate h. This is basically a linear regression. Okay. Finding h is a good linear regression. Z and x are your data now. H is your own number. It just shows up your data. That's fine. Run a linear regression, run your data, you get an h out. So you run in your regression to get h. So this is the basic idea behind topology estimation. Okay. Any questions for this? So we're, we're not going to write down exact problem, but the idea is very simple. And you have a linear relationship, you can have some data, you observe this data, this is some error, you run at least one in the okay. quite, uh, To do this, it's quite simple. Can do this. Any questions? I don't know what it is. Okay, good. And this is a good example of both where the technology came along and then the algorithm came along, right? So again, before this kind of measurement technology, the way you would find H is you send an engineer to go around and look at it. Just look at the lines. And somebody will manually construct this. So that's not doable for a city like Seattle. It's too costly. Okay, so once a sensor came along, and then running this kind of least square become you know became extremely simple, and now we can do this now. And it's sort of, sort of something that ten years ago was you know, not technologically possible. Nowadays, if you're a utility, you can run this problem in a few minutes. Have data on this. Of course, in practice, it's much much more complicated than this linear relationship. But the idea is basically, and you take a medicine first. You run through advanced algorithms to save manual labor. You don't want people to go out. And that is always sort of cheaper and also more accurate than sending somebody else. Okay. So that's the idea of regression. Uh, any general questions for regression? OK, so if now, let's take a five-minute break. Then we'll look at you know, the other 
I guess, you know, comparable to regression is now what happens if you want to estimate a binary outcome or do look at classification. Okay, so classification basically is, if we look at regression, then anything that produces a real number in regression, this, for example, the state, right, the angle, uh, the angles in the system, or the load for tomorrow, things like this, or your goal is to get a real number out of it. That's called regression. Classification is something that uh, requires a discrete output. Okay, so it's not a continuous number you want, but rather, there's a discrete output you want. Right, so we're not trying to guess numbers now. We're trying to guess uh, so whether there's sort of some discrete set of possibilities. You want to classify which what it is. And so in power system, the Example that's often used is a zero fault. Okay, so this is a discrete yes or no question. And then yes or no. Right, so you're not really estimating a real number, it's just yes, no, zero or one if they're following the system. There are other classification questions that maybe require more than a zero one answer, there could be that which line in the system could be switched. Okay, so this is again, there's sort of many lines in the system, but again, it's a discrete concept. There's really not a continuity of possibilities. Okay, so whether there's fault, if you switch line, which line it is. There's a big question that sort of operators now always ask is, should we call the main response? And so the main response is something that doesn't happen too often in Pacific Northwest, but does happen fairly often in systems like California or Texas. So this is where if you live there, you get a text message on your phone saying that, you know, please reduce your demand, the system is undergoing the stress system and so on. But there, again, the choice is a discrete choice, as you, you, yes or no. Again, it's not a, it's not a continuous value trying to predict. So this kind of thing shows up very often in the system. So this is a call for classification. So the way we deal with the data and the way we come to the conclusion from here is different than the way we, when we are trying to estimate a real number. In some sense, this is, in some sense, this is a harder problem. So discrete things are often harder. But in another sense that the tools we use are often very similar. And still, we have some data. You define a loss. You try to optimize something. You try to optimize a prime tree. That will explain the data. Is so this clear? So distinction between regression classification. But all this is really, at the end of the day, what type of object is the output of the system? Okay, so the We'll start off with the simplest classification problems, right? So instead of where there's many possibilities, we'll just look at whether you can get a yes, no possibility, right? So whether it's for yes or no. Okay, so this is the so one example that's very important and it's sort of hot topic now is you give, sorry, you can measure data out of power system. 
And often your question is whether this grid will be stable. Right? Does it blow up in the next minute or so? Is it stable or is it not? That's a classification question. Your outcome is yes or no. If it's yes, you take, then you take some actions. If it's no, then the grid keep operating. Okay, so this is actually a sort of pricing question you will have. It's in real time, just by looking at the measurement, do we know whether my grid will be okay for the next minute or so? This is not a trivial question to answer, but this is sort of example of how these kind of tools are being used. Okay. So think of why this is a hard problem is how do you predict what the grid will do? So let's say I take a power system right now. I give you the state of the system. I give you sort of the measurements I have on the grid. And I ask you a question of, okay, for the next minute, what happens to this system? What is the sort of classical way of finding this out? So well, what is the straightforward way of answering whether a system will be stable or not? Right. So the classical way of finding out whether the grid will be stable is basically the power system is something defined by a bunch of differential equations. So if you know the current state, in principle, you can solve that differential equation and look at the future. You can do that in principle. The, the problem in practice is grids are large. Grids are things with you know, thousands of buses. So what you end up with, you end up with differential equation, it has thousands of variables with thousands of equations. It takes you longer to solve that equation than in real time. So to understand what happens for the next minute, may take you an hour to solve the equation. So that's not very useful in real time. So the long haul is that if you give me the data, now can I predict yes or no without physically solving that differential equation? Again, it's not something we can do. Even with today's computer, we cannot solve the differential equation that fast. Okay, so this is a very concrete example. And then uh, for another trivial problem, that's uh, some of the uh, things we do in this class and we try to Okay, so classification happens a lot. Right? Yes or no questions happens a lot. And the, so there is sort of the geometry, geometric way to think about this is often the following. Uh, that you basically have some data and you have some labels associated with the data. Okay, so what you have is you have data. In this case, you have x, y coordinate. You have some label. This is, let's say, blue or red or class versus class one. Yeah. So you have this kind of, this is your data. So you have the x, y coordinate, and for some of these data, you just label it blue red or class of class one. But I think remember for classification, and that's a mistake so that you believe me, as if I call it class one, class two, these are just names. There is not a notion that class two is bigger than class one. And that's the to remember. And so normally you see there's 10 outcomes, number from zero, one, two, three, so on. There is not a, these are not numbers. You cannot compare them. You cannot add them, you cannot subtract them. These are just labels given to different categories. Okay, so this is the entire category. There's not a class to regard in the category. There's nothing like this. But once you have a lot of alpha, it's actually a common mistake to, uh, you know, think of there's some you know numerical value assigned to something being class one versus class five. There is not. Yeah, there's a simpler category where you can call this blue red if you want, or you can give you know, labels class one, class two. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So this, um, well, yeah. This Sure, yeah. Yeah. What is because uh, if you want to pronounce the class, then you will get all the time to pronounce the class. Right, so that's a good question. Right? So here I'm showing you this is called a separable class because there's a clear way to separate the two classes. 
as the way it uses is basically now, as I say, you have a new data point coming in. Let's say this is your new your new data point. Now, uh, so you know, we look at the the data point is coming in, the right side of the blue side of the right side is coming in. But now the data point is coming in, the right side of the right side of the right side is coming in. That's how you use passes. And that's the simple data, based on x, y, and coordinate, you have the labels. New data comes in, you want to now give it a label. Right? So, for example, this is maybe a system with fault, this system with no fault. Now we have a new x, y comes in, you want to say there's fault and no fault. You can just look at which what which side is involved. Right. So there's two things. One is of course you want to draw a line that doesn't pass over there. Right. So your job is to find a slot. In this case, it's not hard to find the line. There will be cases when it's impossible to find the line from there. That's where there's more of this happiness. And really, if you think about your networks, what your networks is very good at. As finding sort of weird curves, that's actually weird. That's actually also what your network does. That's why it's successful. As they may be possible to find a linear plane, that's actually successful. It may be very possible to find a weird thing. It turns out your network is something that gives you this question. Where the data is the only one. And if you add a new data from the um, you are even very difficult to find the. Uh, so a lot of them, but based on the principle, this point is kind of serious. Now it's your job to talk to very positive. Okay, so the addition is the addition. Yeah, so this is not the new principle. You tell me this is the new principle. Okay, yeah. So this is learn talking computer vision, right? So what does computer vision do? The class example is show you a picture, and ask your class why is a cat or a dog. Right? So the picture doesn't change, you give it to the computer. Internally, it's basically you run something like this. And then we'll tell you whether it's cat or a dog. Right? And it's just that it's for our applications, normally there's a different interpretation to being zero or one. And then you end up using different techniques for the data. So the techniques that's useful in vision, like for example, convolution neural networks typically not super useful in cloud. Right? But uh, the idea is the same. <laughs> you have some things, you have some labels, new data, you want to assign a label. So this is the sort of the easiest case you can find. Two data is a very, very closer, it's a line, closer, exactly. This type of thing that we any other questions for this? So your job is to find the line. Right, your job is to find the line. And once you find the line, then you can very little. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is what you can You can really think of you know, near network as really good at uh, finding nonlinear regions. At least in this case. So the requirement is to draw a line that is constructed Right. So one requirement for this simple example, where we can be on the line, now I post all red points on one side of it, all blue points on the other side of it. What do you think? Then you're supposed to find a line that doesn't, right? In this case, it's your job to find a good line. It's your job to find me the best line for this case, for the given data. Is it, is it done by uh, user doing or computer done? Yeah, so we'll show you a formula you plot that in computer does. It's like linear regression. You write down the optimization problem, computer will do it for you. You just need to know what is the optimization problem right now. So it's exactly similar. So in the homework, remember linear regression, you have a command, right? You basically switch that code and call something else, we'll find you this. So it's just the computer will do it for you. But we're trying to understand you know, some idea how the what exactly is the computer doing, and uh, have some idea of if it doesn't work if it doesn't work perfectly how to, you know what is actually okay because there's not a trivial thing there's many lines that's actually this path 
there's this one, there's this line, there's this one, there's many, many ones. There's a notion of a best one, actually. So what does that mean? What is the best one? Which why is one line better than others? If you cannot perfectly separate, how do you account for error? Things like this, which will come. But when you do something like your homework, I can you know be an example showing you this is a command. Like do this, we'll find you the one. But now you'll be sort of asked to graph log So look at the graph of the Good. Other questions? Okay, so things are linearly separating is sort of very easy. Right? So very easy. Most data are not going to be separable by a lot. Right? So the, most most data are not uh, not exactly separable by the line. There is a very classical example to this that shows you the, the limitations of using a line to separate data. And the classical example is the XOR function. Okay, this is XOR function. Okay, so XOR of taking, so this is, Right, so I'm assuming we all know what XOR is, right? So XOR is the exclusive OR. This is 0, 0, 1, 1, false. True. Right? So this is your XOR function of this logic gate. You can actually pause this on, on, on grid, right? So you can have this as being the Zero zero point. This is one one point. So let's say if it's false, we're going to label it by uh, by red. Zero zero one one. If it's true, we're going to label by blue. Zero one one zero. Okay. So this is the Graphical representation of XOR. Right. Uh, also, there's no one. Yes. No matter how we log it doesn't work. It can't it. But in some sense, this should be not that hard. There are clearly different. There are clearly two class of points here. But I ask you to come up by hand. Some other artists need to do that. But how do, I, how do you get a computer to do this? It's actually not that easy. So, this is a sort of classical example, on classical case, or non trivial, or classical case, non trivial. Okay. So, we'll look at you know, how do I do that? What is the best line? If it's not linearly separable, what do you do? There's no line that goes through it, but we do want to separate the point somewhere. So this is again where you use different basis function again, or use kernel and things like that. Okay. Any questions for these two examples? Okay, good. So we'll start off with a linear model. So we'll look at you know what what if I just want the best law to separate the points. So we so we'll look at so non lines later. So let's. Say we're to in your model first. This is called logistic regression. Okay, so this is it's called regression. Again, this is a for historical, this is a really gives zero or one answers. Okay, so it's called regression for historical reasons. It's called a regression because at that time everything was called a regression. But <laughs> really, logistic regression is a classification method. For historical reasons, this is called a regression. But this is very widely used. So that's a terminology of state list. Okay. And the main idea is to define a right loss. Okay. So remember, being sort of linear regression, right? Your loss is the distance from your prediction to the true value. You can define the Euclidean distance or different norms. When things are categorical, right? There's no notion of distance anymore. This is not a distance. 
between what your prediction and the actual thing. So either you predict correctly or it's not distant. There's not a notion of how close we're getting to the right answer. Right? So apparently there's not that. So logistic regression is a way to recover this idea of how close you are to the right answer. So can you think of a way to do that? Right? So your label is sort of zero and one, you know, one or zero, or true and false, or blue and red, this kind of thing. Is there a notion to say, well, I predict a wrong, but I'm actually really close. Or I predict a right, but I'm, you know, actually I may have been wrong, I'm sort of far away from that idea. And so the big thing with logistic regression is basically you want to think of, is there a notion of distance when you just have categories? And the way you introduce this notion of distance is you introduce softer labels. Okay, Be, instead of trying to predict exactly zero or one, you say, let's do something slightly easier. So this is called soft label. What you do is you take data. Through a classifier, instead of predi predicting the probability, instead of predicting exactly what it is, as you predict the probability of sort of what. Okay, right. So the classifier, right? So the classifier technically will should give you it should give you zero or what. That's too hard to work with. We want sort of notion of distance of how close I am for being correct. So we do that instead of predicting zero or one directly, you say, what is the probability of being one? And so this gives you a confidence. Okay. And really what comes out is you use this notion of probability. Think of things you think are probability. Of course, at the end of the day, if you need zero or one, what you do is just look at the probability. It's above 50, you say it's one, it's below 50, you say zero. That's one way to assign labels. But when you think of the classifier, first let's think of this is the outcome of the real number. Instead of just saying zero or one, I think of this real number between zero and one, we're thinking of this as probability. So the output is between. Zero and one. Okay, so it's not it's not zero or one, as you're looking at the interval of zero to one. Right? So this is a whole interval you can possibly uh, consider. Right? So and now between zero and one. So what you need is basically need a function that maps real numbers to numbers between zero and one. Okay, so, right, so it's a probability, so it's even zero and one. How do you make sure it's even zero and one? This is the idea is you output some number, a real number, you just scale it to be zero and one. In the function that you do this. Is this clear? Is this the way the goal? Right? So our goal is to get probability. Probability is the number that's bigger than zero, less than one. So I need somehow the outcome of the classifier to be always between zero and one. Right? So there's many, many functions that will do this for you. Turns out the one that does a good job is called a logistic function. So logistic function, that's why it's called logistic regression. As a function you use is between zero and one. And the logistic function is defined the following. Or today, I guess it's sort of more popular to call this a sigmoid. It's exactly the same thing. This is, you take some z, so this is sigma z one over one plus e to the minus z. So the output of this function is basically between 
Right? So you got a function that's uh, between zero and one. Okay. So what happens when you see a zero there? And z is very big for this kind of something. What, right? Z is very big, this is very small. So one over x minus one. And z is very small, it's very negative. This is very large. So one over very large number is zero. So this is just a function with output between zero and one. So this thing looks like this. Right? That's a function on z. One, zero. If I know the value of Z. Questions? No, no, what happens is that this is just a function definition. Oh. This is a function definition. Now we're defining a function. Well, the name is the data for this thing. Then that's used in the. Yes, well, use this later. It's not trivial to see where the data comes in. Yes. But uh, as before that, Basically, we need to solve a function that when you take the argument, it's between zero and one. And then we select that function. And the first is to see this function actually works. Okay, you're putting any real number in P here, it's between zero and one. That's one. Okay, so basically, what Z, what Z does is you want to use your data for this, and uh, if you say that this Z uh, somehow you need to get your data. Convert to a confidence, how confident you are. Put this through this function, get a probability, evaluate the probability, get it out. That's the thing we're trying to do for this kind of thing. Okay. Now that it sort of takes some steps to do it, it's, like it's not a trivial way to do it, but it's not very difficult either. So we'll stop here today, and the next class will sort of finish at least on this regression. Okay. As for actually, by the end, the equation you get will be very easy. But it sort of takes a little bit of steps to get to that function. Okay. Good. All right. So let's stop here today. Again, the homework will be on Thursday. So the next homework will be out uh, either tomorrow or Thursday. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay.